अखंडम सच्चिदानंदम अवांगमनसगोचरम आत्मानम अखिलाधारम आश्रय भीष्ट सिद्ध आई टेक रेफ्यूज इन द सेल्फ द इंडिविजिबल द एक्जिस्टेंस कॉन्शियसनेस ब्लिस एब्सोल्यूट बियॉन्ड द रीच ऑफ वर्ड्स एंड थॉट एंड द सबस्ट्रेटम ऑफ ऑल for the attainment of my cherished desire so um come to text number 181 text number 181 um we have actually completed the teachings so congratulations there you made it through what we have been given so far is an outline of advaita vedanta and the definitions of all the important concepts you remember brahman atman maya uh, the subtle body causal body physical body the universe um then uh, you know consciousness and the nature of the ultimate reality and uh, nature of superimposition and how to overcome that so all of that has been talked about and now we will uh, what is ahead of us is shravana manana nididhyasana what we are supposed to do is as long as we do not reach enlightenment we do not get that uh, insight we are supposed to study this contemplate it and meditate upon it shravana manana nididhyasana shravana is hearing manana uh, is contemplation or reasoning and nididhyasana is meditation so that's what they're going to talk about that is one and the last thing that will be there will be will be jivan mukti which is the result of all of this is freedom enlightenment and freedom so this is what is ahead of us now text number 181 evam bhuta swaswarupa chaitanya sakshatkar paryantam shravana manana nididhyasana समाध्यनुष्ठानस्य उपेक्षितत्वात् ते अपि प्रदर्श्यन्ते टिल सच रियलाइजेशन ऑफ द कॉन्शियसनेस व्हिच इज वन्स ओन सेल्फ इट इज नेसेसरी टू प्रैक्टिस हियरिंग रिफ्लेक्शन मेडिटेशन एंड अब्जॉर्प्शन समाधि देयरफॉर दीस आर आल्सो बीइंग एक्सप्लेन्ड सो एवं भूत इन दिस मैनर स्व स्वरूप चैतन्य साक्षात्कार until we realize our own nature which is consciousness swaswarupa our own nature chaitanya consciousness sakshatkara sakshatkara means a direct realization or direct knowledge what does it what does direct knowledge actually mean in this case it means uh, recognizing something which is always and continuously present to us uh, so the remember the story of the 10th man we discussed it uh, uh, i think last sunday and the sunday before that the 10th man you know the 10 friends who cross the river and then they think that um, have we all crossed or did somebody drown and they count and uh, they find only nine people each counter of course is not counting himself and does not realize that he is the 10th man until somebody comes and points out the 10th man is still there 10th man has not drowned you are the 10th man now the 10th man was always present even when i was counting with the, the counter was counting and finding only nine the 10th man was present all the time so in the same way we are consciousness right now existence consciousness bliss unlimited is is what we are right now but we don't recognize it so what was enlightenment the enlightenment was when the 10th man recognizes i am the 10th so this is what is called a uh, sakshatkar a direct literally sakshatkar means a direct cognition or a, or a direct introduction to uh, something so in hindi also in sanskrit sakshatkar is a direct introduction to something when you directly realize what it is that i am there are a couple of points i'd like to make here one is that this sakshatkar this direct realization of who i am this directness is of two kinds again the directness is of two kinds 
it's easy to understand this if you look at the the story or the parable of the tenth man the tenth man being the person who was counting being himself the tenth man was always directly present to himself was always there at no time was he not there so that's the first kind of directness that the tenth man is always present exactly in this in in that way we are all the time obviously consciousness uh, this infinite existence consciousness place and what more happened that the tenth man realized with the help of the person who was uh, showing them is realized that i am the tenth 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and then i am the tenth so that's the second kind of directness what's the first kind of directness the naturally existing tenth man i'm always there so the naturally existing ever shining uh, consciousness which i am that's the first kind of directness the second kind of directness is when the tenth man realized oh i am the tenth so that second kind of directness is what is called enlightenment or it is called sakshatkara here when we will realize oh i am brahman so how is that possible uh, you know it's because i am already brahman but i do not recognize it because of the of ignorance and that is overcome in that second kind of directness the sakshatkara where that flash of enlightenment so when we we are doing vedanta we call that second kind of directness we call it enlightenment as consciousness you are always present and you are directly present the direct availability of your real nature is not appreciated not recognized when we recognize this directly available own nature he calls it swaswarup our own nature directly available all the time like the 10th person that is enlightenment that enlightenment is an event the directness of our own nature is not an event it's always present but the uh, in what we call uh, enlightenment or direct realization sakshatkara that's an event that happens it removes ignorance and our real nature is realized so until that happens he says paryantam up to that point what what are we supposed to do then till then shravana manana nididhyasana samadhi anushthana shravana uh, the hearing and what what are these and how to do that we will all see now all that will be talked about manana reasoning um, and or reflection as it says here nididhyasana vedantic meditation culminating in samadhi samadhi is not a separate practice vedantic meditation which culminates in samadhi um, so usually you will see shravana manana nididhyasana and, sh- and samadhi being included in nididhyasana here the author has uh, specifically so, uh, you know emphasized samadhi samadhi anushthana practice apekshitatva it is required you have to go to go through this as long as you do not have realization so practices are of two types one is um, that uh, um, you know the, depending on the result one is called drishta phala another one is adrishta phala so the adrishta phala means so these are terminologies from the ritualistic portion the vedic uh, ritualistic portion the, the yagyas so there are two kinds of rituals one which gives you a result here and now in this life and another one which gives you a result which promises you a result hereafter so if you perform these rituals you will go to heaven now you don't know you haven't gone to heaven yet so uh, what uh, how long do you perform those rituals as long as you are alive you keep on doing that uh, but the ones which give you drishta phala immediate result in this life immediate result in the sense in this life itself how long would you perform so for example there are rituals which promise you there'll be rainfall or you'll have a child or you'll defeat your enemy in battle rituals like that so though all of those defeating the enemy in battle or getting rainfall or having a child uh, those are drishta phala that means uh, something that you see in this very life so how long are you supposed to do that practice until you get the result because you are expecting the result in this very life why am i saying this this practice what we're going to talk about shravana manana nididhyasana hearing reflection meditation how long will you do it 
depending on the result. What kind of result are we expecting here? Drishtafala. Drishtafala means um, a result in this very lifetime where we can actually experience enlightenment. So you keep on doing it till you experience enlightenment. Not till the end of life, uh, unless you do not experience enlightenment till the end of life. Let's hope we will get enlightenment before that. So you keep on doing this until enlightenment comes. How will I know if enlightenment has come? Believe me, you will know. Sri Ramakrishna says, don't worry, you will know. Um, so, these, these steps, Shravana, Manana, Nidhid, Dhyasana, and especially Samadhi, these are now being described. Um, we are going to talk about them in detail. A little bit about spiritual practice, at the risk of repeating myself ad nauseum. Um, you remember the structure, the paradigm I've given you, the three cross three metrics of spiritual practice. Um, problem, solution, method. Three columns, problem, solution, method. And then three rows. The problem being ignorance, solution is knowledge, and the method is jnana yoga, the path of knowledge. So what is mentioned here, shravana, manana, nidhid, dhyasana, hearing, reflection, meditation, that is jnana yoga. So that's at the highest level of practice, the way of knowledge. Then at the, in the second row, you have problem is, um, is the flickering mind, the disturbed mind, or, or the what is called vikshepa, the, the unfocused mind. Solution, focused mind. Method, upasana, or worship, or meditation. This meditation is different from the Vedantic meditation. And then that last are uh, the ground level, the, the foundational level of problems, impurity of mind, chitta mala, impure mind. And the solution, pure mind, chitta shuddhi. Method, karma yoga. So uh, you have these three levels of practices designed to give you solutions to three levels of problems. Now we will see Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. Remember, this is the highest and the final level of practice, the path of, uh, of knowledge. And remember, all of these practices go on together. It's not that you have to do karma yoga for 40 years and then come to a Vedanta class. All of it goes on together. Um, before I enter into this, um, a Tibetan Buddhist teacher said, how do you listen? So they have the same method of practice. So when you, uh, apparently when you enter a Tibetan Buddhist monastery, the practice is hearing, reflection, and meditation. It's there in their texts also. And uh, one Tibetan monk said that when we, in our first class, uh, the monastic master said, how do you listen? So the instruction was how not to listen. Do not listen like an empty, like, a, um, like an upside down part a leaky pot, dirty pot. Don't be like a like an upside down pot, uh, leaky pot, and dirty pot. What's an upside down pot? So an upside down pot is when you pour water into it, everything uh, you know, like it goes uh, slides down the sides. Nothing goes into it because the pot is upside down. Similarly, the, there might be somebody whose mind is so blocked is is not at all uh, receptive to the teachings, and whatever is being said not going in at all. Nothing is not being absorbed. So for example, Swami Ranganathanandaji used to tell this joke uh, when he was in the Ramakrishna mission in New Delhi. So he would give classes which were very popular. Now one day this um, lady who'd come, come very enthusiastically for the classes, uh, he asked her as she was leaving, so did you, did you like the class? And she said, yes, Swami, I liked the class. What did you like about it? He shouldn't have asked that, but he did ask, what did you like about it? And she replied, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate. Oh, hum kya samjhe? Badi badi Vedant ki baat hai. Lekin class bahut badi tha. Oh, what do I understand? They're all big Vedantic talks. But anyway, the class was very good. <laughs> so I remember a friend of mine, once I gave a talk in, in our main monastery, a friend of mine, another monk who's from Nepal, uh, very simple monk. Uh, he is. Um, uh, he doesn't know English. 
So after the talk, I gave the talk and talk was in English. So after the talk, he came up and said, that was a great talk. Uh, and would have been even better if I had understood any of it. <laughs> so that was, of course, a problem of language. But upside down part means I have not got, I have not received anything of the teaching. Don't listen like that. The second is a leaky part. A leaky part is when you pour water or something into the pot because of a hole or something, the, the contents leak out. So after a week, after a month, nothing is retained in it. I, I don't have any understanding or any recollection, no, no holding on to what was said. Um, to overcome this, the traditional teachers used to recommend uh, memorization. So before every class, you would have to recite what was taught in the earlier class. Mm, I was reading about Swami Chinmayanandaji, who's the founder of Chinmay Mission. So he wanted to learn Vedanta the traditional way and his guru, Swami Shivananda of the Divine Life Society told him that I'll send you to a guru. Uh, uh, Swami Chinmayananda was from Kerala. So, uh, so I'll send you to a guru who, by the way, he's also from Kerala. That was Tapovan Maharaj, uh, who was a very great non-dualist who is to live in Gangotri at that time, Uttarkashi and Gangotri. Um, so he teaches, he's one of the few who will teach you in Hindi because you can't, you can't learn. There are other great teachers also, but they teach only in Sanskrit. So Swami Chinmayananda goes along to Tapovan Maharaj and Tapovan Maharaj uh, says, I'm not going to teach you in Malayali. Malayali is the language of Kerala. So he says, I'm not going to teach you in Malayali. I'm going to teach in Hindi. Um, and so the class has started and the rule was you have to recite whatever was taught in the earlier class and then, and then you are allowed to attend the next class. And it seems once Swami Chinmananda actually failed. And if you fail to recite it, that's it. You're barred from future classes for this lifetime. <laughs> You're excluded. Swami Chinmananda was almost got chucked out once he couldn't recite some particular verse. Um, and these... Uh, 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 others, um, the other monks begged in his favor, so so he was allowed to stay back. Yeah. So one one way of making sure that we uh, we uh, retain what is taught, but it's a, it's a very difficult requirement actually. And the third thing is um, is the dirty part. So dirty part uh, is where a person has sort of made up his mind that this is wrong, or I know better, or I'm or skeptical. Not giving the teachings a fair uh, hearing. So that's a dirty pot. Whatever you pour into it, you might pour pure water into dirty pot, but what is retained there is, is, is dirty water because it gets mixed up with the dirt inside. Uh, another interpretation of the upside down pot is the old story of the Zen master and the tea ceremony, you know, where a student goes to the Zen master and um, asks for teachings and the Zen master starts teaching and the student, whatever the Zen master says, the student says, oh, that, I know that. Uh, this, And finally, the Zen master says, all right, let's have some tea. And so he starts pouring tea into the student's cup and it overflows and the student says, it, it, it's enough. Um, it's overflowing. Stop, stop. And the Zen master says, unless you empty your cup, how will you taste my tea? So that's another um, uh, uh, another meaning of the upside down pot where I'm not taking in anything because it might be that I'm full of my own concepts. Uh, it's full of my own kind of uh, theories and I'm not. It, it happens a lot these days where we go to classes and courses and uh, we're already full of preconceptions, our own reading. We know a lot already and we keep trying to integrate it. You won't believe the number of uh, you know, people who um, send me books and articles and you know, uh, suggested reading either written by themselves or reading for me. I'm not interested. You are supposed to listen and, and uh, keep your mind on what is being taught here. So 
uh, one must empty myself, uh, empty oneself and receive the teachings. One must uh, retain the teachings. The retaining the teachings is important. Uh, retaining is, is a very deep thing. You know, one must be able to hold on to it and stay with it. Sri Ramakrishna, at one point, you find in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, a Vedantic discussion is going on. And Sri Ramakrishna listens carefully. He doesn't say anything. At the end of it, he says, the words are good, but they must be assimilated. What you're talking about is good, but it must be assimilated. So assimilated means retained. And retained, you stay with it. Um, and then, yeah. So, uh, that is Shravana. Now, there is a method to it. Shravana does not mean just hearing. It means systematically studying. Studying what? Studying the texts. Which, which texts? Well, primarily the Upanishads, which we will come to next after finishing Vedanta Sara. So there is a system of studying it. What is the system meant to do? We'll talk about it. It's a detailed description of the system is given here. There's a system of studying it. What is the system meant to do? It's meant to extract the meaning from the text. Think of the system, which we'll talk about. The system has six components or six stages. You can think of it as an algorithm with six steps. So these six steps or the six, six component machine will extract the meaning from a text. Why would you want to extract the meaning from a text? Well, the, I mean, why not just ask the person who's written it? And the problem is the author is not always available. When you're looking at the something like the Vedas, the authors are not around. You can't ask them, what did you mean to say? So you have to interrogate the text itself. So this is called hermeneutics. It's a um, word which has come into vogue recently, especially with uh, studies of the Bible in Europe. I think 18th, 19th century, they developed, the Germans developed several methods of um, studying the text uh, biblical texts, finding out which part goes with which part and what is the point of the whole thing. The ancient Indians had developed hermeneutics, very sophisticated hermeneutics, methods of extracting the meaning from a text. Why did they do that? Because they had to find out the meaning of uh, the Vedas. This whole religion was based on the Vedas. So they had to extract the meaning from the Vedas and sub often it was very difficult. Um, the ones who specialized in extracting the meaning from a text was the school of Purva Mimamsa. Purva, so the six orthodox schools of uh, Hindu philosophy, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga, Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa. The Purva Mimamsa, the word Mimamsa means a reverential inquiry. Pujita Vichara, reverential inquiry. Reverential inquiry into what? Into the text. What does what is the text teaching me? Mimamsa means that. Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Purva means earlier. Uttara means later. Earlier reverential inquiry or earlier inquiry into the earlier portion of the text. What is the earlier portion of the text? The ritualistic portion of the Vedas. What we call the Karma Kanda. It's, it's the bulk of the Vedas are full of rituals, which are mostly obsolete now. We don't do them. Uh, Hindus, we have replaced the Vedic rituals mostly by our modern pujas, uh, the ceremonial worship of deities. Of course, in Hinduism, nothing dies out or nothing is completely uh, replaced. So always there'll be layers and the uh, Vedic ritualism is still alive in, in our uh, pujas. But the point here is the school which specialized in finding out the meaning of the texts which talk about Vedic rituals, um, they are called the Purva Mimamsa. And we, Vedanta, we are called Uttara Mimamsa, the later Mimamsa, because we deal with the later text. What is the later text? The, the uh, Upanishads. So how to extract the meaning and in reverential inquiry into the meanings of the later part of the Vedas? That's the meaning of, of Uttara Mimamsa. And that's the name of our school. What we are doing here now is Uttara Mimamsa. The machinery for this investigation was developed thousands of years ago by the school of the, the earlier school, the Purva Mimamsa, those who dealt with the ritualistic portion of the Vedas. 
So they developed sophisticated ways of looking at texts and finding out the meaning. What does it mean um, when the texts say this? And so here is the method, method that is followed. And what, the, what they will do here is they will um, take up as an exercise, as a sample, one part of, of an Upanishadic text. And it will be the sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad, which is a classic text because it contains the that thou art, that Tvamasi. So, um, so we'll see that now. That's how Shravana is done. That's how um, Shravana means hearing, but it's a, it actually means a systematic study of the text. And by the way, before we go into it, as we see, as, as you shall see, this, this method which will be given here, the six um, components, you can apply them to any text. Today, if you have a, a, an essay or a book you want to understand, if you apply these six components, you will get the meaning of the text. It's, it's quite, it's a very uh, systematic scientific way of approaching a text. Of course, it has to be um, a well-written text. You know, sometimes uh, talks or, or even writings are all over the place. So uh, we say that sometimes we Swamis give talks. So there is a, there's a Hanuman, a monkey model of giving a talk. The monkey model of giving a talk, a talk is you start here, then you jump to the next branch. And from that branch, you jump to a different tree altogether. And you start in one place and end up in another place. <laughs> so if you do that, it's very difficult to extract the meaning from the whole talk, because there probably isn't much of a meaning to the whole talk. But if there, it's a systematic text or systematic teaching, you can use this six uh, step or six, uh, six part algorithm to extract the meaning. All right, let's see. What is this method? Shravanam nama sharvidha lingair ashesha vedanta nam advviti abastuni tatparyavadharanam Hearing is the ascertainment through the six characteristic signs that the entire Vedanta philosophy establishes the one Brahman without a second. All right. Um, one more thing. Each of these steps, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, um, study of the text, reflection, and meditation has a specific purpose. What is the purpose? The purpose of Shravana, the first step, is to ascertain the meaning of the text, is to ascertain the teaching itself. What is the text telling me? What is Vedanta telling me? To answer that question, you have the first step. So at the, how, how, when do, how do you know you have completed the first step? You have completed the first step when you know, yes, I understand what Vedanta is telling me, what the Upanishads are telling me, what all the Vedantic texts, Gita, the Brahma Sutras, Vedanta Sara, I know, I have a clear idea of what it is telling me. And we know what it is telling us. That thou art, that tuamasi, aham brahmasmi, we know that. Um, you might say, okay, I know it. So, I, so that means I don't need to study the text. Now we just know it in, in, you know, it won't do to know it superficially. We must know it thoroughly in the sense that how does this text tell me I am Brahman? How does, for example, the Katha Upanishad tell me that I am Brahman? How does the Chandogya Upanishad tell me that I am Brahman? So on. Uh, which are the sentences which tell me directly that I am the absolute? Which are the sentences which are indirectly connected to the teaching? Which are the sentences which define the absolute reality? Which are the, so with all those things, we must know. That's the purpose of the first step, Shravana. It tells us the teaching. And the first step is complete when I know what the teaching is. Then what's the problem? The problem will be that I know what the teaching is, but I have many questions. I have many doubts. I don't understand lots of it. So now I go into the second stage, which is called mananam, reflection. I have many questions. I have many objections. Um, things which are not clear about, things I don't understand, and things I don't get, things I, I think are, are wrong. I, I have got a different point of view, different take on it. So all these, this is clarified in the second step. When is the second step over? When you can say, not only do I know the teaching, now I get it. I am convinced, I'm sold. I get it, it's clear. I've got clarity now, I'm convinced about it now. I know the teaching and I understand it. 
Then what is the problem after that? What is the need for the third, the third step meditation? I know what the teaching is and I get it. I have no more doubts, but it's not a living reality for me. It's, I cannot honestly say that I am Brahman. I cannot honestly say that I've got the benefit from it. I have overcome suffering. I know honestly that I'm beyond death. This is not a living reality yet for me. So to make it that living reality, that is Nididhyasana, the, the final step, the Vedantic meditation. In technical terms, the first step gives us the teaching. The second step overcomes an obstacle called the, um, the um, asambhavana. Asambhavana means the impossibility obstacle. After I know the meaning of the text, my reaction is impossible. Brahman, an infinite existence, such a thing is there? No. I am that Brahman? No. It, it's an impossible thing. The teaching, what it's saying is flat out contradictory. So that's the impossibility problem. That is overcome in the second step. And the third step overcomes a, another kind of problem called viparita bhavana, contrary tendencies. Contrary tendencies. These are tendencies, ingrained patterns of behavior um, where even after understanding, even after clarity, I still continue to behave as a body-mind. I still continue to behave as a person, as a limited person, subject to frustrations and misery and ups and downs and problems. So that is overcome at the third stage when you assimilate the teaching. So I Vivekananda said, called it assimilation. He said, uh, tell yourself again and again, I am that, until it tingles with every drop of your blood. So it becomes a living reality. So the point I wanted to make was, the first shravana, it gives you the teaching. The manana and nididhyasana in, in Vedanta are seen more as overcoming problems. Manana overcomes what problem? Problem of impossibility. I don't get it. This is impossible what you're teaching. And the nididhyasana overcomes what problem? The problem of contrary tendencies. That pre-existing conditioning of the mind. That has to be overcome. You have to soak in, assimilate, make it a living reality. All right, so this is good. Now we can go ahead. Shravanam Nama. What is Shravana? Sharvidalinga, with this sixfold method, uh, or the, which is called Sharvidalinga, means literally six signs. Six signs are used. Ashesha Vedanta, of all Vedanta, the entire corpus of Vedanta. Remember, Vedanta basically refers to Upanishads. So of all the Upanishadic texts, Advitiya Vastuni Tatparya Vadharanam, the clarity that will come that all of Vedanta ultimately refers to one non-dual reality, Brahman. And I am that Brahman. This is what Vedanta is teaching you. And it won't do to say that, yeah, I know it. You just told me I am Brahman. Not so fast. When you are actually confronted with the Upanishads, show me. How does it show that you are Brahman? Show me. How does, how does this um, sentence um, tally with the other sentence? How do they go together? How do they come, come together to show you that you are Brahman? Now, what are the six signs? This is very interesting. The six signs, this, the six components of the algorithm for extracting meaning. This is Vedantic hermeneutics. 183. Lingani to... Upakrama upasanghara bhyasa purvata phala arthavada upapatya khyani. The characteristic signs are the beginning and the conclusion, number one. Reputation, number two. Originality, number three. Result, number four. Eulogy, number five. And demonstration, number six. And he gives a quote in the form of a verse. Taduktam upakrama upasanghara Abhyasa purvata phalam arthavada upapatti cha lingam tatparya nirnaye. Text number 184. Thus it has been said, in ascertaining the meaning, the characteristic signs are the beginning and the conclusion, repetition, originality, result, eulogy, and demonstration. Okay. So what does that mean? And how do we use it? So from now on, he will tell us how, what, what these steps are 
and how do we use it for understanding a text, especially the Upanishads. Um, very quickly, before we go into each of these steps, I can just tell you what they mean. When you, you get a text like the Upanishads or any text, you have a, um, you know, like a philosophical essay to read. Take a look at the beginning and the end. The beginning literally does mean, need not mean the first sentence and the end need not mean the last sentence. Look at the first paragraph. Look at the last paragraph. That should give you some idea about what the uh, essay is about. It's not conclusive, but if it's a well-written essay, it will definitely give you um, an indication what's going on in this essay. Beginning and the end. Upakrama, beginning. And Upasamhara, conclusion. Look at the beginning, look at the conclusion. In fact, there is a text called Upakrama Parakrama, the power of the beginning. <laughs> I've not read it myself, but it, um, uh, it tells us how to look at the beginnings of texts to get an idea about what the, the text is all about. Oh, funny story that reminds me I had seen this picture in a, in a National Geographic magazine uh, in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. So they have huge collections of manuscripts, uh, old texts. And it's, you can imagine the an amount of time it takes to study all that. So there was this beautiful picture of the old manuscripts have been, they are, they are periodically bought out when there's sunshine. So for their, to protect the manuscripts, to dry them out, I guess. They bought out, kept on wooden benches. And the young lamas, little kids, they crawl under the benches. So it's like a ritual. All the knowledge goes into, it's supposed to soak into your head if you crawl under the benches, which are loaded with all the books, you know. So <laughs> if only it was so easy. So that is Upakrama Upasanghara, beginning and end. Then the next one is um, Abhyasa, repetition. What is the point which is hammered again and again and again throughout the text? If it's a well-written text, the central point will be mentioned more than once, what, what they're trying to say. You know, if you look at a politician's speech, give me votes, vote for me. So that he'll come around to that um, again and again. Um, classic example is the sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad, nine times. Tattvamasi, 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 that thou art, uh, that thou art nine times. So that must be the central teaching. Then, so Abhyasa means repetition. And then Apurvata, what's the unique message in that? You can, you, it will talk about many things, but it will talk about something unique to it, something that you don't find elsewhere. And that will be the special teaching. That's another sign of the teaching of that text is a uniqueness, something special, unique message we're trying to get from it. Then another good way of look, finding out the meaning of a text is Arthavada. It's a good way. Eulogy, praise. What is being praised? What is being advertised? What is being sold in that uh, text or in that essay? Um, so a politician who's giving a talk about, you know, a political talk would talk about his or her achievements and the point being that you should vote for me. Similarly, what is being sold here? You will see that um, in Upanishads, uh, enlightenment, Brahma Jnana, the knowledge of the absolute, that is being praised again and again as that which solves all our problems. So then you know, all right, this is what is being advertised. So this must be the teaching of the text, Arthavada, which means um, praise or eulogy. And then Phalam, Palam means result. By looking at what is promised, what is the benefit of it? What is the purpose of it? What do you get out of it? By looking at that, you'll get a clue about what the teaching is. And then um, Upapatti, look at arguments. You will find, in a, especially in a philosophical paper um, or even a political speech or whatever, you will find certain amount of reasoning is going on there. So if you try to see what, what is the author or the speaker trying to prove? So the, what the, that person is arguing for, like a lawyer arguing for, so my client is innocent, that all the arguments are going to show that the, the person 
I'm defending is innocent. Um, so by looking at the arguments, you realize what the lawyer is trying to say. So if it's a text which is arguing for a particular position, by looking at the arguments, you get it. This is the teaching. And they are all, all the arguments are going to show that you are Brahman. Right, so these are the six uh, components. And now he was, he's going to give us a demonstration. The sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad is a pretty good, um, you know, like a case study. Also, because we took the, that Dao Wat Mahavakya from the sixth chapter. So he's going to take the sixth chapter and show us um, how to apply these six, uh, this, these six signs. Text number 185. Prakarana pratipadya syarthasya tadadyantayo ho upapadana upakrama upasangharo yata chandogye shashtadhyaye prakarana pratipadya syadviti avastuna ekam eva dviti yamitado ed aitadatmyam idagam sarvam ityante cha pratipadanam. The beginning and the conclusion mean the presentation of the subject matter of a section at its beginning and end. As for instance, in the sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad, Brahman, one without a second, which is the subject matter of the, of the chapter, is introduced at the beginning with the words, one only without a second, and again at the end in the words, in it, all that exists has itself. So pretty self-explanatory. Prakarana Pratipadhyasya, whatever is the point of the whole section, whichever you're studying, the text. Adhyantayo, the beginning and the end, it will be presented. So this is called Upakrama, Upakrama, beginning. Upasanghara, conclusion. So take a look at the beginning and the end of this. It could be a book, it could be a chapter of a book, it could be an essay, it could be a speech, whatever. Yatha, like, example. Chandogya Shashtadhyaya, in the sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad. This is the chapter where Shweta Ketu uh, comes back from school and his father asks him, uh, his father asks him, um, uh, did your teachers teach you that by no knowing which everything is known and so on. And then finally the father will tell him there is one reality which you are, that thou art. So that's the chapter. So when you look at that chapter, at the beginning and at the end, you will find in the mention of Brahman, the absolute reality. So at the beginning, and very interesting. So one without a se second, ekam eva dvitiyam. One without a, one only without a se second. Ekam, one. Eva, only. Advitiyam, without a second. But uh, if you look at the chapter, actually, it doesn't start with, the first word is not one without a second. It starts with the story of uh, Shweta Ketu. So therefore, it's not just the first line or the first word you have to look, look at. You have to look at, you have to read it a little bit to see the beginning. And it ends with um, this reality we are talking about, the one without a second, is the self of all beings. So what is being taught in the sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad? Brahman, a non-dual reality, which is you yourself. So this is the power of the beginning and the end. Then the next sign is 186, text number. Prakarana pratipadhyasya vastuna tan madhye paunaf punyena pratipadanam abhyasaha yatha tatraivad advitiya vastuni madhye tattva masiti navakritva pratipadanam. Repetition is the frequent presentation of the subject matter in the section. As, for instance, in the same section, Brahman, the one without a second, is repeated nine times in the sentence, thou art that. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, another clue to the meaning of the whole section is, what's being repeated again and again? So in that sixth chapter, you will find father, the father tells the student, his son, uh, nine times, that thou art, that thou art, that thou art, tattvamasi, tattvamasi. This is pretty much the point of the, of the whole section. Now, it's not always this easy. Sometimes you may find 
um, the point made just once or twice in a section. It, not, not every section has uh, and the central teaching repeated nine times for our benefit. Then text number 187, uniqueness. Prakarana pratipadyasya advitiya vastuna pramanantara vishaikaranam apurvata yata tatreva advitiya vastunam manantara avishaikaranam. Originality means the subject matter of a section is not available through any other source of knowledge. As for instance, in that very section, Brahman, the one without a second, is not knowable through any other means except the Shrutis. Again, pretty much um, self-explanatory. The, the section is teaching us something that's unique. That's the purpose of the section. You don't... Um, so here, it, for example, it teaches us about Brahman or you are Brahman. And you don't find that elsewhere. Now you have to be careful. Elsewhere, you do find it in all the Upanishads. All the Upanishads are teaching that. And you find it in all the Vedantic texts. Um, you find it in all the translations of the Vedantic texts. You find it if you read it in Hindi or Bengali or English, you find the same teaching. It doesn't just mean the original Upanishad alone in the Sanskrit. But this is the teaching of the, um, uh, the unique teaching of the Upanishads. So this is where you find it. So, and this would be the the point of the whole teaching, point of the whole section. Another clue is result. What do you gain out of it? If you look at the result, what is being promised, what is being advertised, by that you will, uh, what is being promised, the benefit, you will understand what is being taught. Result means fruit, phalam, fruit. Text number 188. Phalam tu prakarana pratipadyasya atma jnanasya tadanushthanasya va Tatra tatra shruyamana prayojanam yatha tatra acharya van purusho veda tasya tava deva chiram yavanna vimokshe atha sampatsye ityadviti avastu jnanas chatat prapti prayojanam shruyate. The result is the utility of the subject matter of a section, that is self knowledge, or its practice as mentioned at different places. As for instance, in the same section, the words the man who has got a teacher knows Brahman. He has to wait on, only till he's delivered from the body. Then he becomes united with Brahman. Here, the utility of the knowledge of Brahman, the one without a second, is its attainment. So in other words, result is enlightenment and liberation. He says, Tatra tu prakarana pratipadyasya atma jnanasya tadanushthanasya va tatra tatra shriyamana prayojanam. What is being taught there? What is taught in the section of the Upanishad? Self-knowledge. I am Brahman, that thou art. Uh, what is the result of that? You see, there itself in that section you will find the result has been mentioned. What do you gain out of it? This is called prayojanam. The benefit, the purpose of this study. What are we looking for? By looking at that, so when you look at the result, you will understand the teaching. If the result is moksha, liberation, then the teaching must be self-knowledge. Why? Because we have, uh, Advaita Vedanta says that ignorance is the cause of bondage, ignorance about ourself. So if the result is liberation, then the teaching must be self-knowledge. Knowledge must be the teaching. Knowledge about what? Knowledge about the self. I am that. And this is actually a quote from the sixth chapter which goes on to say, Acharya Van Purusha Veda. It is the student who has a teacher who becomes enlightened. So that's a way for teachers to remain relevant. <laughs> no, but it's important. I have seen so many cases of even um, serious students, you know, who try to read it for themselves. It's easy to be misled. Um, the subtleties which... Uh, if you're just reading the book, if you're just reading a translation, you don't get it. And a teacher can point out the subtleties. Differences, slight differences in interpretation. Either a person does not get what is being taught here or gets it wrong, even worse. Gets it wrong. Simply gets it wrong. So that's why Acharya Van Purusha Veda. It is the student who has got an Acharya, a teacher, who becomes enlightened. And after getting that enlightenment, 
and he talks about videya mukti and jivan mukti of course the moment you get enlightened i am brahman you are liberated that's jivan mukti and then he talks about that's understood here and he talks about videha mukti you live in this body this life continues uh, as long as the prarabdha karma the the karma which has generated this body is not exhausted so you live as an enlightened being and after that is what you call attainment of uh, videha mukti the bodiless liberation from the point of the liberated person is the same thing there is no difference having the body and dropping the body at death is a minor thing for the uh, minor matter for the enlightened person is nothing of consequence but it's a big deal from our perspective then one more is praise or eulogy advertisement what is being advertised what is being projected here prakarana pratipadyasya tatra tatra prashansana arthavadah whatever is being taught here the uh, praise prashansa the praise that is called arthavada arthavada basically is vedic eulogy so certain in the ritualistic portions certain rituals yagyas they are praised so these examples are also archaic examples are meant to make a thing easy but these examples are so ancient um, they have lost relevance for even hindus let alone people in the modern age here even uh, traditional hindus also don't get the examples uh, so example is vayur vai kshepishtha devata among the vedic gods the god of wind is the fastest what does it mean that you perform this particular ritual because uh, the god of wind is the one who gives the results fastest now what is what's the point of it the point is that this particular ritual is being advertised by praising the god of wind you are uh, being encouraged to offer a sacrifice to the god of wind i can see your mystified expressions but it will become clear as i go on yatha tatraiva utatam adesham ap आदेशम प्राक्ष्य येनाश्रुत श्रुत भवती अमत मत अविज्ञात विज्ञात अद्वितीय वस्तु प्रसंशन यूलॉजी इज द प्रेजिंग ऑफ द सब्जेक्ट मैटर ऑफ द सेक्शन एट डिफरेंट प्लेसेस एज फॉर इंस्टेंस इन द सेम सेक्शन विच सेक्शन आर वी टॉकिंग अबाउट सिक्स चैप्टर ऑफ चंदुग्य उपनिषद have you ever asked for that instruction by which one hears what has not been heard one thinks what has not been thought one knows what has not been known what are we talking about here consciousness one that which is behind which is which enables all hearing all understanding all thinking but which itself is not heard of which you cannot hear see smell taste touch consciousness you cannot think about it also it it illumines all our thoughts and perceptions so have you been taught that thing it's a kind of advertisement for the subject matter so these are praises which have been spoken in praise of brahman the one without a second then finally the text number 190 arguments logical arguments like a lawyer's arguments if you look at the arguments themselves you understand what is being said here prakarana pratipadya artha sadhane tatra tatra shruyamana yukti rupapatti hi यथा तत्र यथा सौम्य एक मृत्पिंडेन सर्व मृन्मय विज्ञात सैद वाचारंभण विकारो नाम धेय मृत्तिक सत्यम इत्यादो अद्वितीय वस्तु साधने विकार से वाचारंभण मात्रुक्ति श्रूयते डेमोस्ट्रेशन इज द रीजनिंग इन सपोर्ट ऑफ द सब्जेक्ट मैटर ऑफ अ सेक्शन एड्यूस्ड एट डिफरेंट प्लेसेस बेसिकली द आर्ग्यूमेंट्स विच यू कम अक्रॉस as for instance in the section in question which section chapter 6 of the chandogya upanishad the words my dear as by one lump of clay all that is made of clay is known every modification being but an effort of speech a name and the clay is the only reality about it furnished argument that modifications are merely an effort of speech to establish brahman the one without a second what does this mean you find that in the 6th chapter of the uh, chandogya upanishad basically what it means is this your father told the son did your teachers teach you that by knowing which everything is known 
sarvamidam eka vigyanena sarvam vigyatam bhavati by one knowledge you know everything now, the immediate reaction is how can we know everything by one knowledge by knowing botany i know all about plants but i don't know about animals i don't know about the stars and the planets by knowing astronomy you know about the stars and the planets but you don't know about particles you know particle physics um who was that <laughs> even when you know and it, it's uh, the very nature of knowledge is is it's um uh, thompson he got the nobel prize somebody was giving a talk about the constant flux in which science finds itself so thompson uh, in the i think cavendish laboratory in cambridge where they discovered the electron right there's this i don't know if it's cambridge or oxford and uh, they showed me a little lane uh, a very narrow lane where they said that the modern world was established was was is founded on the discoveries made here swami the first was a, a lab uh, where um, they discovered the electron so all our electricity and all of that is based on that and then there was this pub um, i think it's called the eagle where watson and crick they talked about the dna the double helix structure and then one more where i think something which talks about uh, the semi our whole information technology anyway three discoveries each of them leading to nobel prizes it says no, our whole world is based modern world is based on these discoveries oh, where was this is it cambridge or oxford i think it's oxford cambridge 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 yes yeah. cambridge yes it's a very narrow lane you can't even take a car inside it it's a, and it's all within walking distance yes and so somebody was saying in a talk they discovered uh, professor thompson there he discovered the electron he got the nobel prize for it 20 or 25 years later his son made a discovery that the electron is um, you know his father had discovered electron is a particle his son discovered that electron is a is a wave it's not a particle and he got the nobel prize for it and then i think it was uh, schrodinger who said uh, that it's a wavicle and he got the nobel prize for it and then heisenberg before that actually he had said we do not know exactly what the electron is and he got the nobel prize for it so <laughs> um but the arguments in uh, favor of what you are trying to establish so argument is like this do you know that knowledge by which everything is known our immediate reaction is what could be that knowledge by which everything is known you know one branch of knowledge you don't know anything else you know only that so he gives an argument here just as by by knowing a lump of clay you know everything made of that clay in the sense what would you know that it is clay alone from a lump of clay you make the potter can ma- make a wide variety of pots pottery different designs and all but you know one thing if it is made of that lump of clay you know for sure it is only clay and not, nothing else but clay all the forms and names are just that their names and forms they have no substantial reality whatever pot is made out of it pottery is made out of it you touch it you'll be touching the clay you weigh it you'll be weighing the clay so the reality is that that uh, what is what the potter does is give a shape to it uh, a form and a function to it so the foundational reality remains the same and that's the argument there is one foundational reality and the entire universe is nothing other than that and that that foundational reality is existence so everything else sat sat means pure being everything else is nothing other than that sat it is just name form and function so if you know that sat you know the reality of this entire universe you know that that pure being that infinite absolute being then you know everything because nothing in this universe can be different from that being uh, i was reading uh, heidegger's introduction to metaphysics and he says so heidegger was is the one western philosopher in in modern times who has gone back to the greatest of questions the question of existence itself and he says very nice analysis he says he says this question of existence is the greatest of all questions how 
He says it is the first of all questions. And uh, he says it is the widest of all questions. And it is the most profound of all questions. So first, because before existence, there's other than existence. Before existence, there's nothing. You have to start with existence itself. Uh, widest, because it includes everything. Uh, what could be outside existence? Only non-existence could be outside existence. And non-existence does not exist. So it, uh, the question of existence includes everything. And then he says it's the most profound of questions. What is a profound question? A question which questions itself. So when you are questioning the nature of existence, that question itself is an existing thing. So it's questioning itself, it's self-reflexive. So because of these reasons, he says, Heidegger says, this is the greatest of questions that what is existence? And the argument here is just like a lump of clay, you make pots out of it. Um, the pots are nothing but, but that clay. Similarly, the entire universe, if you would know existence, what existence is, you would know the entire universe. By, the, by this one knowledge, everything is known. Eka vijnana sarvam vijnatam bhavati. You ask, would, would you know the different kinds of names and forms and functions? No. That is the province, the provenance of Maya. But one thing would be sure, you would know it is Brahman only. It is that one existence only. Yeah. So that's an argument. And by that argument, what do you, what do you get? But what we get is that this whole section is about Brahman, is about uh, the absolute existence. Um, okay, I think we'll stop here and take a look at the activity in the chat. So today we saw what is Shravana. Shravana is the systematically studying the text in order to extract its meaning. What is a system? The system has uh, six components. Uh, upakrama, Upasanghara, beginning and end, first. Abhyasa, repetition. Third is, um, uh, is palam, result. What do you get out of it? Fourth is uniqueness. What is the unique message of this section? Fifth is the uh, praise. What is uh, attavada? What is being praised here? What is being advertised here? And finally, upapatti. What is being argued for here? With these six, we can extract the meaning from a text. All right. Let's quickly look at uh, Rick says, haven't many enlightened people continue to do Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana? Yes, but not to get enlightened. You are right. They continue to hear, reflect and meditate, but not to get enlightened. You mentioned the Buddha and others meditating all the lives. Correct. So it could be as, a, as an example, setting an example to others, that this is what you need to do. Or it could just be, you know, after enlightenment, the body mind continue in the mode which they are most accustomed to. So you would never find an enlightened person saying, all right, that's done. Enlightenment, I've ticked the box. Now I'm going to go back to my job in Wall Street or just something else. Let me go ahead in life and do something, uh, you know, which I've not, not done yet. No, once you, die, you, have, you have attained that, you stay with it. Not for getting anything more. You've already got it, but that becomes your mode of life. And of course, it has a secondary function as a teacher, as a, a person who uh, stands as a beckon, as a demonstration to others. Patrick says, how does an object arise and disappear in consciousness? Through names and forms. How does a pot arise and disappear in uh, clay? How does a wave arise and disappear in water? Krishnamurti says, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana are meant to make us realize that the universe is a projection of that which I am, correct? Also, for someone who is still on the grip of ahankara, bhakti yoga teaches us to practice Ishwar alone exists. I do not. Not quite. Advaita tells us that the implied meaning behind both of these statements are the same. Tattvamasi. However, as both bhakti yoga and jnana yoga go in parallel, how are these two reconciled in practice day to day? All right. So Bhakti Yoga does not teach you that you do not exist. That would be disastrous. Bhakti Yoga teaches you that um, God exists and you are the devotee of God. So uh, the Lord is my master. I am the servant. The Lord is my father or mother and I am the child. The Lord is my friend uh, and so on. These are the attitudes that if I don't exist, then there is no point. I do exist and I have a relationship with God. 
and that is very helpful in spiritual practice until we get we are ready to claim i am brahman we still remain in the dualistic mode of i am a jiva i am a i am an individual sentient being and so i have a relationship with the absolute that relationship is my relationship with god even after you are ready to claim that i am one with god i am one with god is is only from the ultimate perspective from the personal you know the even after enlightenment the body continues because of past karma the mind will also continue at least for this lifetime and so in the case of many enlightened beings their continued existence is often the existence of a bhakta of a devotee not compulsorily so sri ramakrishna puts it beautifully the even after enlightenment the ego comes back the i comes back it it floats back again just like the body comes back into our awareness of the mind comes back the ego also will function now what do you do with that ego so it can continue in two ways he says one way is the way of the devotee where it says i am the servant the lord is my master though i know i am one with the lord like hanuman says as atman as pure consciousness i am one with you o rama but as hanuman i am the servant thou art my master so that can continue or the ego can continue to say chidananda rupa shivoham i am of the nature of pure consciousness pure being that is also uh, uh, this the uh, you know uh, the, the state of a jivan mukta this discussion we have had in the three meanings of the use of i what does i mean i for an unenlightened person and i for an enlightened person so i for an unenlightened person is i am this person this body mind that's it but i for an enlightened person has two meanings one is i am brahman in the ultimate sense and it ultimate means not later on right now and the secondary sense of i would be i am this person whom you might consider enlightened but i am this person and from that secondary sense the enlightened person can still relate to god as as a devotee i am the devotee the lord is my master yeah so until that point my relationship with god continues as devotee and god vishwanath swami tapovanam would also teach any topic once and the students were not allowed to take any notes i didn't read that but yeah that's sounds in quite in character with him he was a very tough teacher and you got to you were given the privilege of attending classes that was there were two classes in a day and you had to, obviously you had to be a monk only monks were allowed and you had to find your own hut or your your cave to stay in and you had to beg for your own food and so these are the rules and um, what else uh, um yeah you you couldn't hang around after the classes to ask questions and so one, one student among after the class he was waiting to ask some further questions to tapovan swami he asked the question and tapovan swami said jaiye manan kijiye brahmachari ji so oh brahmachari novice go back to your hut and mananam the second stage don't ask questions think about it Srinivas asks what is the difference between nididhyasana which is a spiritual practice pre realization and staying with it post realization to purify the mind uh, as we said nididhyasana is meant for overcoming the contrary tendencies of the mind see what happens is by the teaching you get the knowledge i am brahman and nididhyasana is something that enables you to manifest that knowledge in your day to day life otherwise it remains sort of you know like firewalled in a kind of understanding but you can't um, live it and until you live it you cannot be said to be fully realized a fully realized person is called a jivan mukta so nididhyasan helps you to become a jivan mukta and that can continue after the initial breakthrough so you are asking post realization so that can continue after the initial breakthrough the initial breakthrough is i am brahman that happens how do you know the initial it's a breakthrough it will never go away i have heard people saying oh i have had multiple spiritual experiences i have felt oneness with the world uh, and it has come it has gone if it has come and gone in vedanta you will be asked the question to whom has it come and gone 
that one to whom this realization has come and gone this spiritual experience has come and gone is that one does that one come and go no so you are that not uh, the particular feeling uh, mystical feeling which you got at one particular time if it has come and gone that's the mystical experience but uh, in vedanta we are talking about the one who is having that experience or one who is in whose light that experience arises um yeah so that is the breakthrough after that breakthrough one should stay with it and we you see that in the lives of uh, great teachers like ramana maharshi sri ramakrishna day after day week after week so they remain absorbed in samadhi so that overcomes every vestige of you know that uh, that individuality which was there earlier shravani says pranam maharaj for a question from a previous class in the final stages of tattva masi analysis using implied meaning we remove the differences in tat and tvam that's caused by maya and avidya respectively since both are unreal and false correct before enlightenment we haven't realized that these are false then on what basis are we calling maya and avidya false is it based on authorities and shruti no is based on an understanding of the shruti see um you have not realized means what when you are studying it the upanishad all the vedanta texts are enabling you to see how uh, the upadhis the limiting adjuncts are false are appearances um i in my dream i am running through a forest being chased by a tiger or something like that you know or i'm running to catch a subway train a more more realistic uh, uh, example in manhattan i'm running to catch a subway train and i'm just going to miss it just now now when i wake up i realized that it's perfectly all right there is no subway there it was a dream and there was no train and i was not late now all of that is an appearance notice i was there in that dream too but all the circumstances of the, of the dream were appearances now the arguments will be given in advaita vedanta will go to show in the waking world also from the perspective of consciousness how do these things this body and this mind and this world how do they limit consciousness they don't limit consciousness they are in consciousness consciousness is not limited in a body or a mind a body mind appears in consciousness and these arguments are meant to demonstrate to us the falsity of these limiting adjuncts so we are supposed to grasp it not take it on authority if you take it on authority the world is false won't work for you you must come to see that that uh, maya and its products are uh, illusions are appearances the clearly appearances in consciousness is it not is does that have to be uh, argued we just see everything in this world including your body including the mind are they not appearances in awareness do you need to be you know do you have to believe in it or do you you can just see it it's a fact right now another argument from the perspective of existence just like clay and the pots if you look at existence as a clay then is it not true that everything in this universe which you are experiencing are just names and forms imposed on existence then girish says advaita or buddhism or sankhya for that matter are models of reality correct conceived by the human cognition the vyavaharic domain correct isn't it possible that with the onset of an enlightenment even one may realize that reality is quite different from these models yes and no the moment it's a good question i'll talk about it this sunday actually the question is that um, before enlightenment we are studying these models after enlightenment are these models falsified two things will happen one is you are set free from the models you can happily move between the models once you make the breakthrough from that perspective you see the different models and you see their interplay you see their advantages and disadvantages you see their pedagogical value their instructional value because they help others to understand what you have got but are they wrong they are not wrong this is again something that vidyaranya discusses 
indirect knowledge, like the knowledge that you get, gain by studying Vedanta, this indirect knowledge of Paroksha Jnana, is it wrong knowledge? After becoming enlightened, do you see that this is wrong? No, it's not wrong. Why is it not wrong? Because he says, um, because it is not falsified. You see, I am the body-mind. After becoming enlightened, I realized what I thought earlier was wrong. It is falsified. But if I read, I am Brahman, or there is some Brahman, after becoming enlightened, will that knowledge be wrong? No, it will just be confirmed. So these models are confirmed after enlightenment. None of these models will be falsified. After enlightenment, can you see this entire, what you, what you are beginning to see now, can you see this entire thing as a play of consciousness and matter? Yes, why not? Can you go a step further and see all of that matter as appearing in consciousness? Yes, why not? Can you give overwhelming importance to the consciousness aspect of it so that the appearance nature become dwindles to nothing, to inconsequentiality? Yes, why not? You go to extreme non-dualism. It works. Um, yeah, so you, you'll also see the, the relative advantages and disadvantages of the models. You will see that Sankhya is a sort of limiting instance of Advaita, for example. Um, Advaita would be a wider uh, model and Sankhya would be a more narrower perspective. Um, Alpana says, what in the subtle body decides or knows it is time to leave? Uh, not in the subtle body. Leave means leave the body, you mean, after, at death? So it is our karma. So when the physical body dies, the physical body dies because karma is finished. Prarabdha karma is finished for that particular body. Then the, the subtle body will transmigrate. It will go on to uh, other uh, bodies, other lokas, propelled by past karma, only for the unenlightened. Then Rick has given us a link to, yes, uh, Cambridge history. Trinity College. J.J. Thompson was a Cavendish laboratory who discovered the electron in 1897. But I think he got the Nobel Prize a few years later after that. Good. So we have seen what is Shavana, the six components of uh, systematically studying Vedanta. So that's something. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu